When we think of growing up, I would venture to say there are places that have always been there. And one place that most people might think of would be their library. Oh yeah, the library, little place when I was growing up, but it had the most beautiful leaded glass windows and dark wood. I loved nice. it there. Beautiful, sounds great. Well, here in central Ohio, the Columbus Metropolitan Library has been around for 150 years. Can you believe that, Charlene? Hardly, that's a long time. Right. And in honor of their sesquicentennial, we sat down with them to highlight some of their more memorable events over the years. Here's that story. Open to all. Back in 1873, some of the foundation documents talk about the library being open to every citizen in Columbus. It was so important they decided to carve it in stone and it is one of our core values today. And so it's just really baked into our philosophy that this is a place where everyone is welcome. Everyone is going to get a level of respect and service that spreads across the entire community. In the 19th century, the idea of a free public library open to everyone in the city was not a common thing like we think of today. Before the Civil War, there were several efforts in Columbus to start a public library. There was the apprentice group that tried to start a subscription library in 1831 that lasted for a few years. The Athenaeum in the 1850s um, lasted until the Civil War started. And then in 1871, after the Civil War, there were a group of Columbus residents who got together and decided to make a request to city council for a public library. They planned their request and in 1872 went to city council and city council passed the ordinance for a public library that would be free and open to the whole population of the city. And on March 4th, 1873, the Columbus Metropolitan Library opened in the southeast corner of City Hall. City Hall at that time was where the Ohio Theater is today. They were able to open with about 3,000 books and 96 magazine and newspaper subscriptions. James Grover was named the first librarian. He was a pastor at First Episcopal Church and the namesake of author James Grover Thurber. And we have library card entry where James Thurber, the author, um, got his first library card. And then he came back as an adult and upgraded to an adult library card. People were so excited to have the public library in City Hall that first they had to expand the hours, then they had to hire additional staff. The second staff person hired was John Pugh, who eventually became the director and our longest serving employee of 65 years. They went back to city council by 1896 and asked for additional space. And so they were given another room in city hall that became the first dedicated children's area. Even with all of that, the building was still overflowing with people and books. So it was clear that a new standalone library was needed. The board approached John Pugh with the task of building a new standalone library. John Pugh decided to reach out to the industrialist Andrew Carnegie to ask for funds for a library. People understand just the phrase Carnegie Library. I think at the end of Andrew Carnegie's life, he really understood he had amassed a fortune. I think he was uh, interested in a legacy and just really thought that the people that worked in the mills and others needed this democratic institution and it was missing in so many places. So it was really his thought about how people could rise up and he landed on the idea of the public library for that purpose. Pew first wrote to Carnegie. Carnegie by that time wasn't really keen on funding urban libraries. He really wanted small town libraries. So he wrote back sort of a lukewarm letter. So John Pugh decided he was gonna go to New York and have a meeting with Andrew Carnegie. So he went to New York. Um, the meeting wasn't really going that well. 
And then they got on the topic of their shared experience as sons of immigrants. Andrew Carnegie came over from Scotland as a young boy, and John Pugh actually grew up in what was called Wales Alley. A few months later, on December 31st, 1901, the letter was received that Andrew Carnegie had decided to fund the library at the cost of $150,000. Andrew Carnegie's gift actually came with three restrictions. One was that the City of Columbus would fund the maintenance for the building, that they would purchase the land for the building, and that the words, my treasures are within, would be on the exterior of the building. So City Council quickly passed the ordinance for the maintenance, that was no problem. The words, my treasures are within, no problem, but the land became an issue. By that point, most of the core of Columbus had been filled in. There weren't a lot of spaces. Thomas Ewing offers to donate the land, um, this property that's 96 South Grant Avenue. It had currently served as the Ohio governor's mansion. Rutherford B. Hayes had stayed there. But at that point, it was a little further afield from downtown than people wanted, so there was little controversy around that. But it was just the right size of land, so that was the space that was chosen. The next step was to hire an architect, so they chose Albert Ross, who had uh, actually built several Carnegie libraries already most notably the Carnegie Building in Washington, D.C. It took four years to build this building. About midway in, when they were ready to um, put the facade on the building, though, they um, realized they wanted to make a change. So the original plan for the building was going to be a pretty, you know, industrial-looking brick building, and they just decided they wanted that to, building to be more inspirational so they decided to upgrade to Vermont marble. So then it was up to John Pugh to write back to Andrew Carnegie and request $50,000. Carnegie wrote back in a telegram right away and agreed and said that his vision was absolutely for this kind of inspirational building. The groundbreaking was March 22, 1903. So on that opening day, it was rainy, turned into sleet at one point. Two of the speakers couldn't make it. Still a wonderful day for the city of Columbus. Thousands of people showed up and got their library cards. One of the really interesting stories of the early Columbus Metropolitan Library building was that it was not only a library. We housed the Columbus Museum of Art before it had its own building um, over on Broad Street. At one point, we also were the home to the Franklin County Historical Society, which today we know as COSI. And throughout the 20th century, we often had groups that would utilize the library in times of crisis. When the city hall building burned, the um, mayor's office and city council moved into what was the auditorium in the basement of Main Library. During the 1913 flood, the library served as a place for families who had been disconnected from each other to reconnect. The librarians actually kept a role to connect people, and it was also just a place for people who had lost their homes or their homes were flooded to come together and get services that they needed to be able to rebuild. During World War II, the library served as the Civilian Information Center, so that would have been a place not only to get information about what was happening in the war, but also to check and see who had been killed in action that day. If that was your family member, you would come to the library and there would be a list. Almost as soon as the Carnegie Library opened, it became clear that branch libraries were needed. There were so many people that were coming to the main library that there was congestion on Grant Avenue. There were reports in the newspaper that um, you couldn't even find a hitching post for your horse at certain times of the day. Then World War I breaks out, kind of ends that conversation for a while. By 1928, there was again another citizen-led effort to start thinking about branch libraries. And it was actually the, the Federation of Women's Clubs, women, who got together, marched down to City Hall, and asked City Council for branch libraries in their neighborhoods. A couple weeks later, City Council passed that ordinance, and the first four branches were established. They were Clintonville, Linden, Parsons, and Hilltop. During the Great Depression, we um, were able to expand further out in the county through what we called county station libraries. So these were small library deposits, maybe 500, 1,000 books. They would be in schools or firehouses. 
these eventually became some of our next branches in the branch lineup, Kahana, Reynoldsburg, Hilliard, Dublin. So after World War II, Columbus begins to expand exponentially. So you start to see the growth of the suburbs. It became clear yet again that this Carnegie Main Library was not gonna be large enough for the city of Columbus. Um, so there were a series of expansions to the building. Mostly the, those early expansions housed books and staff offices. By the 1980s though, even that was not gonna be enough. So we embarked on a new building campaign that basically set up the footprint of the library that you see today with the new addition to the back of the Carnegie Library and the additional space that that offers. When you think of 150 years and a library being funded eight years after the Civil War but then going through so much of what this country has experienced during that time, uh, the Roaring Twenties, the Great Depression, uh, not one pandemic that we all know of, but two pandemics, two world wars, the uprising of the 1960s. The library was always here to support the community in whatever was happening uh, related to their information needs. And I, I think that's such an important legacy. It's common for families to pass down heirlooms from generation to generation. Javier, do you have any family heirlooms? Yeah, my grandmother's quilts, that counts, right? Oh yeah, it They're does, beautiful. absolutely. I have my great aunt's green depression glassware and nice. that's kind of cool. But sometimes I wonder how to take care of these things so that they last for generations to come. It's interesting that you mentioned that, Charlene, because we had a chance to meet with a curator over at Ohio History Connection to discover best practices when it comes to preserving all different kinds of family heirlooms. Here are her tips. Thanks for having me here today. Well, thank you for having me. So what exactly is a family heirloom? So a family heirloom can be any object that's passed down through the generations. It can be any material as well. It's just anything that has a story to you and your family. Furniture is a popular one, uh, glass and ceramics, maybe you have some flatware or some silverware. I know that uh, figurines are uh, something that gets passed on as well, and textiles too, so quilts and, and uh, different wedding pieces maybe or something like that. So there are three basic ways that you can take care of your heirlooms. So it's um, environment, uh, creating a really nice environment for it to live in because just like us, they like to be comfortable. It's creating a good storage area. So having them on display all the time can be harmful. Um, there's a, multiple factors that can uh, degrade your objects down. So you want to make sure you have a good rotation schedule. And cleaning, just like your house. Cleaning is an important part because uh, dust can actually break down certain materials as well. Okay, let's start with environment. What's the best space to keep an heirloom in? So environment can be kind of tricky because each different type of material um, has a different temperature and humidity level that it likes to live in. But generally for mixed collections, if it's anywhere between 52 degrees and 60 degrees, that's a good area. Um, and between 42 and 60% relative humidity. And that could vary if you wanna go and look at the different materials, but you should be good with those general uh, rules. Mostly you want something away from the light because light can damage multiple objects, not just textiles. So if you have something that's hand painted or filigreed, that can also damage. And you want a cool, dry environment and one that's stable. So any kind of really radical flux um, in temperature or humidity can actually cause an expanding and contracting of materials, mm -hmm. which some things are really sensitive to, like wood. And so that can cause cracking, it can cause flaking of paint or adhesives, and it's not good. Okay, <laughs> and what is everything on this table? So everything on this table is different ways that you can help. So we have actually a couple different storage options here. So to keep things out of the light and dust, uh, to prevent overcleaning, you can uh, have uh, 
a good rotation schedule. So for me, I have a couple of quilts that my grandmother made. Mm -hmm. And so I'll have one out on display, but every year or two, I'll actually switch it out with another one so that way it doesn't get too much light, it doesn't get dust, it doesn't get damaged. And it stays pristine for whenever I pass it on. Okay, <laughs> that's nice. And so when you're looking to store an object, you wanna look for acid-free containers. Um, a lot of them will say archival, but archival doesn't necessarily mean acid-free or lignin-free. And those are two materials that you definitely wanna stay away from. So it can come in the form of a tissue. Um, there's foam, so like an ethafoam. I use that a lot for ceramics because it helps to buffer against vibrations too, which can cause cracks and damages. And they come in boxes of all shapes and sizes as well. And then what about this chair? What would we do yes. with this? So for the chair, since it's made of wood and textile, there are a couple of different ways we can go about it. So wood, you really want to make sure whether or not it's finished or unfinished because uh, there'll be different treatment methods. If it's unfinished, really the only thing you want to do is take a nice natural brush and dust it off really gently because if you use a cloth or something like that, it could snag on pieces of wood that you don't even see and slowly break down the chair. For finished wood, however, a nice clean microfiber cloth or a dust bunny even would work really well. You can use a thing called Renaissance wax. Uh, a little bit goes a very long way, but I only suggest doing that only on finished woods and maybe every two to four years because you don't want to do it very often. Okay. Mm -hmm. And no harsh solvents and no commercial cleaners. So. Okay. And then this is a vacuum cleaner? Yes, so my Nilfilisk, uh, it's basically a variable vacuum cleaner so I can control the suction on it. And that's very important because your normal household vacuum cleaner is going to be a little bit more powerful than you want. So you do want something that you can control the suction on it. And we have our little controller here that we use. And so an important thing too as well when you're vacuuming uh, textiles or fabric pieces on furniture, maybe a quilt, you want to use a mesh or uh, some kind of barrier between the hose and what you're vacuuming. Because even if you don't see it, there might be particles or pieces that are coming off. Even if you're super gentle, there might still be stuff that comes off and you wanna save that just in case, like if you're missing a bead from a, a piece of clothing. That's how you would take care of that chair. So you'd basically vacuum the textile part of it and then I would just wipe down the rest of the finished wood with a microfiber cloth. Okay, and I don't think we've addressed silver. So metal can come in a variety of different forms. Silver is one of the most popular. I know there's tea services and flatware. And for metal, it doesn't always equal strong. I know we think of metal and we think it's a strong material, it can take anything. It's actually relatively weak and relatively fragile opposed to uh, maybe something like ceramic or glass. Different metals tarnish and deteriorate at a different rate. And you don't want to polish it all the time because if you polish metal, it actually takes off the top layer of the metal piece. So if you keep polishing it down, it's actually eventually going to cause damage to the piece itself because you're taking bits and pieces of it away mm. each time you do. That uh, tarnish that's on there acts as a barrier too from the elements. So it kind of creates its own little coating to sit in. So if you need to display it and you do want it highly polished, I mean, you can do a polish on it. What I suggest is a dilution of sodium calcinite, which is chalk um, and distilled water and polish it very gently, and then once it is uh, nice and shining, again, you go back to your Renaissance wax, and you just use a very little bit just to create that coating. If you're gonna eat from it, I do not recommend the re Renaissance wax, just because it isn't food safe. <laughs> so probably not a great idea. But um, it will keep your metal looking nice, um, but again, you wanna make sure not to over clean, so minimal is better. <laughs> okay, is there anything else you think is important to know about heirlooms? So there's one more type of material, and that would be ceramics and glass. They kind of go the same way. So I have a piece here. With ceramics, the big part you want to look at is whether or not it's glazed or unglazed. So unglazed will be kind of like a matte finish. It's like your terracotta sort of material. And a glaze will be nice and shiny and colorful. For unglazed, since it's so porous, you don't really want to do much with it. You don't even want to handle it all that much. You don't think about it very often, but we have oils in our hands. So every time you handle an object, 
it transfers a little bit of that to the object, and if it's something porous like uh, unfinished wood or uh, unglazed ceramics, it could permanently damage it or stain it over time. So for unglazed, you basically just want to do a very nice light cleaning with a dry brush, uh, preferably a natural hairbrush. And then for glazed, the glazed is a little bit less non-porous. It has kind of the same properties as glass. So you can do a dry cleaning with a microfiber cloth, or if you want to do a wet cleaning, say it has a little stain or something left over, then what I would suggest is there's a nice product called Orvis paste. And uh, we use this a lot. Basically, we take a little bit of the paste and we distill it down with distilled water. And then like any other cleaning, you clean it down, rinse it a little bit with distilled water, but just on a cloth itself and let it air dry. Well, thanks a lot for having me today. It's been good to learn about how to preserve heirlooms. And now I'm really thinking about what I can pass down to my <laughs> own children. I love clothes, so that's definitely go. on the list. I also have a teapot, which relates to the ceramics bit. So Very thanks a lot. So, well, thank you for having me. Every Buckeye knows about at least one cherished tradition at The Ohio State University. Charlene, what comes to your mind? OH! I-O! <laughs> of course, and I can think of a couple of others. The band forming Script Ohio at uh -huh. halftime and singing Carmen Ohio at the end of a game. Right, those are great traditions, but it turns out that not every campus tradition survives. And there's usually a good reason for their demise. We checked in with OSU historian David Staley to find out more. A lot of the traditions at Ohio State um, were, were born in the late 19th, early part of the 20th century, and they came largely from the activity of students. There was the curriculum uh, that students you know, had to take you know, their, their, their math and their, and their science and, and those sorts of classes. But then there was a, uh, a very well-developed extracurriculum, it was called, and that included things, for instance, like literary societies. In fact, it was one of the first groups that formed on campus, one of the first student groups on campus, were literary societies to, to, to read and discuss literature. And also, given where the university and where society was at the time, uh, it was a literary society just for men, uh, but then women uh, developed their own uh, literary society, the Browning Literary Society. And that was the way in which a lot of what we think of as, uh, as campus or university traditions, they were born from these kinds of student activities. Football and sports generally at Ohio State also began as a kind of an extracurricular. It was part of the extracurriculum that, that, that students started. So football was started really as a kind of a student club, a group of students getting together. And it wasn't really organized by the university until about 1898. And that's, that's true for a lot of sports. Baseball uh, uh, was another one of sports. Uh, uh, track running events. Uh, these would have been pursued by students, and then only later does the university sort of uh, take ownership of them. So there's a lot of traditions, I think, like football, that were born of, of student activities. One of the traditions uh, that, you that you would have seen, uh, even in the early part of, of the 20th century, would have been the requirement <laughs> that freshmen wear beanies. There were all sorts of penalties, demerits, and otherwise, if you were caught walking around campus without your, your freshman beanie on it. And that was a, that was a tradition that lasted uh, probably until about the 1930s. We start to see it, uh, we sort of see it go by the wayside especially because of the Great Depression, uh, and certainly by the time you get returning GIs after the Second World War, there's not, a, there's not the same sort of tradition of freshmen wearing beanies. One tradition that we don't practice anymore is the cane rush. And we don't know when it started. It was probably sometime in the late, uh, late 19th century. So it was a contest between the freshmen and sophomore classes, male students, uh, there was a cane, about sort of this high, and the cane rush was sort of like a combination of sort of rugby and Red Rover and uh, beating up your opponent, but the idea was to move the cane across a boundary. 
Uh, and it was essentially, as I say, just large numbers of freshmen and sophomore students banging their heads against each other and uh, roughhousing in such a way to, to move the cane across. In some ways, there is a tension, I think, between maintaining and holding on to, to traditions and being forward-facing, forward-looking. Uh, but I think it's a, a useful and creative tension, and, and I don't see them necessarily as being at odds with each other. Uh, traditions are as much a connection to the past. And as an historian, of course, I always teach my students about the importance of that connection to the past. As uh, our university uh, attracts more what we call non-traditional students, I wonder what new traditions will form because of that, that kind of student body. Thanks for being with us, and remember you can catch all of our episodes on columbusneighborhoods.org, plus see our stories on the WOSU mobile app. And you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you back here next week on Columbus Neighborhoods.